sexuality and marriage as we think about uh, the culture in which we are living and all the changes that we have seen. But it's not just our culture, but it is many who profess to be followers of Christ who have adapted the very same mindset of the world when it comes to these issues. And uh, so uh, as we considered that this morning, I want to do a message uh, that has to do, I've entitled this, Delusional Desires. Because as we look this morning, that's one of the arguments that often is given is that it's our desires that we have and we need to follow our desires. And that's often an argument that is used for a homosexual lifestyle or um, transgenderism and, and change, seeking to change one's gender, that there are the, these desires that we have. And uh, so I want to just kind of talk about delusional desires. And often the rationale for this is, you know, this is just what I feel, my feelings. Some years ago, uh, some of you older people might remember Debbie Boone had a song that was very popular, um, which went like this. It can't be wrong. Why? Because it feels so right. Yeah, you light up my life. Talking about you know, a love relationship with someone, and we can understand some of the sentiment of that, but, but that, that thinking that it can't be wrong because it feels so right, and that is often the rationale for transgenderism and homosexuality, uh, even heterosexual sin. It, it can't be wrong because it feels so right. And many who want to change their gender just say, you know, it's just how I feel on the inside. And we talked about that this morning, that it's not theology that shapes our identity and our thinking about gender. It's not biology that shapes our thinking about gender, but it's how we feel on the inside. And uh, that often is what is used uh, when people want to, change, so-called change their gender. Um, And so it's gender isn't based on birth. It isn't based on biology. It's based on desire. And it's so sad that we are living a time in which, as I said this morning, parents, the medical field, educators will encourage a child to take drugs have surgeries to change their gender. And if that isn't child abuse, I don't know what is. And, uh, but it's all based upon, it's not based upon anything medical. It's based upon the desire, the feeling of the individual. And uh, so this is something that has become more and more common in, in, our, in our world. Um, And then in terms of sexual orientation, who I love is based upon not the word of God, but it's based upon my desires. And my desires trump everything else. My affections are sufficient grounds to legitimize any kind of a relationship. And again, we will hear this often from people. You know, this is just the way I am. This is the bent and sometimes they will even invoke the God in the conversation. Well, God made me this way. This is the way I am, and therefore, uh, my des- desires are okay. Um, I'm really just being true to myself. I'm being true to who God made me to be, <clears throat> my natural desires. But is, but is that a reasonable rationale? Is it reasonable Uh, just because we have these strong inclinations uh, toward uh, certain things, that that that's okay. Um, Certainly, Paul writes about this, 2 Timothy 4.3. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own lust, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers that affirm what they say. And that's what we're seeing in our, in our, in this progressive Christianity of our day, 
uh, people that come alongside to affirm things that are contrary to the word of God. And at the bottom line, it is based on feeling. It's what I feel. And uh, certainly, you know, that doesn't work in a lot of areas. Um, someone feels like punching you in the face. Well, uh, it just doesn't work. We, 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 would, we would not accept that. When a toddler is throwing a fit, he doesn't want to eat his broccoli or whatever it is as food. Well, that's just the way I feel. These are my desires. No, we see that as rebellion, and, and uh, it's wrong. Um, and we could apply that to so many areas. Just because somebody feels like doing something, it doesn't make it right. Uh, one man said this, one uh, theologian, he said, it is difficult to imagine a society in which everyone acted out of every impulse or desire that they had. Violence and molestation and theft and other serious crimes would be out of control To some degree, every responsible human being exercises a level of self-control. A desire does not justify an action. And this is true for heterosexuals as well as homosexuals. So it goes both ways, doesn't it? But such is the rationale sometimes that God made me this way. And therefore, whatever I feel and desire is is okay. But James, I think, is addressing that question. Did God, did God make you to be inclined to sin, to do sin? James 1, 13 and 14, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, his own sinful desire. And then desire, when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. And so such sentiments in the culture and even among the professing church never leads to a good thing. It leads to a bad end uh, when we think that way. I want to just talk a little bit about a theology of desire. When we think about creation and the world that God made for Adam and Eve, it was a beautiful world. It was a beautiful garden, wasn't it? And God gave him so, gave Adam and Eve so many wonderful things there to enjoy. Not just one kind of food source, but many fruit trees that uh, enriched them. And God made Adam and Eve so that they would enjoy These things, he gave them desires and affections that were good and that were holy. And we too, we have desires, we have an affection. So these are things that God had created and put into our first parents. That they would enjoy things, that they would have desires and, and, and find pleasure in things. So we could think of Adam, you know, making the first chair and uh, presenting it to Eve for her to sit on. And I'm sure that brought pleasure to Adam. We can think of maybe Eve making the first apple pie. And uh, what a joy and a a blessing to be able to eat that and to find joy in that and satisfaction in that. God did not make them to be stoic, to be unfeeling. Everything that he made for them was for their good. Everything he made was very good. And even in their relationship, they were to become as one flesh. There was an enjoyment of a relationship that God had established that brought great blessing and great joy to them, the first parents. And there was this intimacy such that they became as one flesh. And when we think about God, God is no stoic, is he? Uh, Zephaniah 3.17 is an amazing verse. The Lord your God is in your midst, and he will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will rejoice over you with singing. And as we think about the second Adam, when we think about Jesus Christ, the Son of God who was made flesh, Jesus was one who had desires. I, I, I look forward to the day when I will 
eat this Passover with you again, he says, in the kingdom. I, I anticipate that. I long for that. And we can think of Jesus who enjoyed having children on his lap, didn't he? He welcomed them and he enjoyed them. Jesus would say in John 4, he said, my food, what I, what I desire and what I find satisfying for me, my food, my very food, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I find pleasure in that. I find delight in that. Psalm 40 speaks of David and the greater David. I delight to do your will. And so as image bearers who, made, who are made in the image of God, we were created with real desires uh, that lead to find satisfaction. And these are God-given. And so desires are something that are good. Uh, Paul says even in 1 Timothy 6.17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be haughty, uh, not to put their trust in riches, uh, but they are to enjoy all things that God has given us to enjoy. He's given them richly to us to be enjoyed. But don't put your hope there. Don't let that be an idol to you. But enjoy what God has given to you to enjoy. These are gifts that come from your God. And so we have desires, don't we? They can be good desires, and uh, we enjoy uh, good friendship. We enjoy Grater's ice cream. <laughs> we enjoy a lot of different things in this world, and that's not sinful. And the chief end of man is what? To enjoy God, uh, glorify God, and enjoy him forever. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. But we know that that garden scene changed, didn't it? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And uh, with sin came the corruption of the whole man, including his desires. They have now become twisted and tainted by sin. And we see this in the very temptation of Eve Genesis 3, verse 6, this is familiar to us. Uh, but Satan has come to tempt T Eve. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. So here he, he begins to sow doubt in the mind of Eve about what God had said. Um, and uh, so you're, you're not going to die. Verse 5, for God knows that the day that you eat that your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So now he deceives her. He, he sows doubt, and then there is this deception. God, God knows that when you eat this, you're going to become like him. He's holding back from you something that is really good. So he deceives her. And then we see desire. So when, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of, the, of its fruit, and she ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And I think sin has already been taken place in the heart. And now there is this desire for what God has forbidden here is an alien affection now for, for this thing that God has forbidden. Shall I obey God or my own body, my own desires? And that's what's being faced here. And, of course, Eve denies the Lord and his word, and she goes according to her desire, and she eats. And here we have probably, I guess it would be the first wrong desire a sinful desire that is witnessed in the life of Eve and then later for Adam. And Romans 1 talks about this, doesn't it? That God gave men over to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what it is, uh, for what is against nature. Um, and so here is, <clears throat> again, as we think about total depravity, it affects the whole man. It has affected our thinking. It has affected our affections, what we want and what we 
desire. These have been tainted by sin. The fall and sin have hijacked man's desires, his affections, his passions. And now they are bent in a, in a wrong way. Uh, and turn, if you will, to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. These two are familiar verses to us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul here talks about the fact that we are dead in sin and transgressions. And in verse 2 he says, In which we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, these desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. So here is these desires that now have been corrupted by sin and uh, these desires of the flesh and of the mind. And so our desires have been hijacked because of sin. So just because we have desires do not mean that they are right and that they are righteous. Turn over to chapter 4. And Paul here is speaking about that we're no longer to walk as the Gentiles walk, that walk in the futility of their mind. Uh, Verse 18, their understanding is darkened because of the ignorance that is in them and the blindness of their heart. And drop down to verse 22. You are to put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt, According to, notice this, the deceitful lust. These deceitful lusts, these desires that are deceitful, they lead us astray. These alien affections that are opposed to the original image that God had created Adam and Eve in. And we need to understand it's not just in the transgender world, it's not just in the homosexual world that this is the case. This is true for all of us, isn't it? This is true for all of us. Um, John 3 says that, you know, Jesus came into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. And that's what we would be left to ourselves, loving the darkness, that our affections would be drawn to those things that are contrary to God. Jesus talks about, you know, you've heard it said you should not commit adultery, but I say unto you that if you lust in your heart, that you have broken that commandment. So here are these, again, desires that are sinful, that they are wrong. They are contrary to the word of God. And so it's not just for some people out there in the world. This is something that all of us have been affected by. And uh, Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. So we are all messed up by desires that are fallen, uh, affected by sin. And so our desires are not trustworthy guides for us, are they? They are delusional. They mislead us. And as Paul says here, they are deceitful lusts. And uh, so he who trusts in his own heart, um, he is a fool. And so we cannot go on this premise. Well, it just feels so right. It has to be right. No, that's not, not the case. Because we have these deceitful desires that are within us. And so living by these sinful desires um, is wrong. And, it, and they're not trustworthy. They're not leading to holiness. They really lead to ruin, don't they? And when you read in Romans 1, when Paul talks about God giving men over to the lust of their flesh to do those things that are unnatural, they receive even in their bodies uh, the fruit of it. And there's often ramifications physically 
in someone's life as a result of living according to their own corrupt desires. And uh, so you, whenever you, you, you know, you can choose sin, but you cannot choose the consequences of your sin. You can choose to sin, but you cannot choose the consequences of that sin. And we see that there in Romans 1. And so there is ruin that comes when we give in and we follow after our own deceitful lust. Um, it, it, God does not sanction that, and God is not behind that. Um, and so Jesus had a lot to say. He says, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, right? You must d- deny yourself. You must take up your cross, and you must come and follow me. Paul says in Romans eight thirteen that if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. But if you are living according to your flesh, your fleshly desires, you will die. Paul says, or John says, do not love the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it is of the world, and the world is passing away, and the lust or the desires of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so beware of delusional desires. As we think about the gospel, the gospel is God in his grace and his mercy to rescue and to restore, to make new creations, new affections, new aspirations, new desires, and to make us new and to restore the image of God that has been lost. Paul talks about that in Ephesians 4 here, to restore in us righteousness and holiness. And uh, so this is what God does, and he does it through the, the word of God. The word of God shows us that we're sinners. It convicts us of our sin, and we see if we're wise in our own eyes, we're in trouble. And it humbles us, and we are made to see that we are in need of a Savior to save us from our sin. And what is conversion? But conversion is a a change that God brings about. We see that in Ephesians 2 here. God has made us alive together with Christ. He has brought about a new creation. We who are dead in sin and transgressions. He's He's done a heart transplant. And he's brought about a change of mind, a change of affections that brings about a change of will so that now we can do things that please and honor him from a heart that has been changed. But we know that this is an ongoing conflict, isn't it? Because we still have remaining corruption in us. We still have these desires that are sinful, that are wrong. But we now have the Spirit of God who lives within us so that we might live in new and different ways. But there is this irreconcilable conflict that goes on in every one of God's children. And it's going to continue until the day that we are in the presence of the Lord, or Christ comes to receive us unto himself. And uh, Paul talks about that in Galatians 5. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. It gives us hope there, doesn't it? God, by his grace, enables us so that, and given, he has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. And uh, Titus 2 talks about the grace of God that brings salvation. It has appeared, and it teaches us. It teaches us. It schools us to say no to ungodly, ungodliness and worldly desires, passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And so this is, this is the work of grace. This is the work of the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done for us so that we are not deluded, but that we understand what's going on inside of us, and that we are living out what God is working into us by his grace. And we're thankful to know 
that there's coming a day when this battle will be over. There will be the consummation of our salvation. And in, in the face of a culture that says, be true to yourself, you know, do what feels right, do what you want to do, um, we are called to be different. We are called to go upstream, to live differently. And God in his grace is the one who enables us to do so. The old hymn that we often sing, the dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. And uh, so we're thankful, I trust, tonight for the gospel and what God in his grace is doing in the lives of his children. And uh, may he help us to be those who, as Paul says in Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself with Christ and make no provision for your flesh in regards to its lust, those strong desires. Put them to death by putting on Christ. And so may God enable us that we may so live and seek to please him. We got, a few, we got done a little early here tonight. Um, any verses or any thoughts come to mind as, as we think about this sin of our evil desires, delusional desires? Redefine sin. Mm-hmm. Therefore, they yeah. keep trying to make it look good. So yeah, try to justify these desires that are. Of being good just against God. Yeah. Yeah. So that when the child is no longer in the realm of heaven, but they can be free as the angels from God. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, or somebody does something wrong to him, or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? I read somewhere it said uh, a demon came to the gates of heaven and said, I identify as a saint. <laughs> and God's, God said, that doesn't work up here. <laughs> that doesn't work up here, so... Yeah, there was another one I heard that I'm, I'm fat, but I identify as trans slender. <laughs> so. All right, well, let's stand and we'll be dismissed with a word of.